Well, if you have your Bibles, why don't you turn with me to Ezekiel 2. We've been going through a series looking at um, different stories where God shows up and calls individuals for his use and for his glory. Is this on? No, it's not. There we go. Now we're on. Um, and today, yeah, of all the calling stories I was drawn to, Ezekiel's intrigued me the most. So if your Bible is Ezekiel 2. Um, and to give you a little bit of background, in Ezekiel 1, we find that um, Ezekiel is living in the land of Babylon, and he gets this fantastic vision of God, just like Isaiah did in, when he received his call. Uh, Ezekiel goes through a whole lot of words trying to explain exactly what he sees, but the closest he gets is calling what he sees. This is the appearance of the likeness of the glory of God. He doesn't get anywhere close. And after he sees the glory of the Lord, it says at the end of chapter 1, he saw, when he saw it, he fell face down, and he heard the voice of one speaking. Chapter 2. He said to me, Son of man, stand up on your feet, and I will speak to you. And as he spoke, the Spirit came into me and raised me to my feet. And I heard him speaking to me. He said, Son of man, I am sending you to the Israelites, to a, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have been in revolt against me to this very day. The people to whom I am sending you to are obstinate and stubborn, and say to them, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. And whether they listen or they fail to listen, for they are a rebellious people, they will know that a prophet has been among them. And you, son of man, do not be afraid of them or their words. Do not be afraid, though briars and thorns are all around you, and you live among scorpions. Do not be afraid of what they say or be terrified by them, though they are a rebellious people. You must speak my words to them, whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are rebellious. But you, son of man, listen to what I say to you. Do not rebel like that rebellious people, but open your mouth and eat what I give you. Will you pray with me? So Lord, as we look into your word this morning, we pray first of all you give us the ears to listen. You soften our hearts so we may hear your, what you're trying to say to us. I pray that as I preach your word that um, you will help, that you will speak through me and in spite of me. Be with us this morning. We pray and ask this in your mighty name. Amen. So I've realized in my faith journey that um, I spent a lot of time in churches, and I've kind of grown up um, operating on what I called the Field of Dreams theology. Um, you guys know the movie Field of Dreams, right? It's been 26 years. If you haven't seen it by now, you know I feel like the Statue of Limitations on spoilers is done. <laughs> you had your chance. But in the story Field of Dreams, you know, Ray Kinsella, played by Kevin Costner, he finds himself in the middle of a cornfield in Iowa one day, and he hears a voice telling him, and it's one of the most misquoted lines in all of cinema, because we all, we all think it's that what the voice says is, if you build it, they will come. It really is, if you build it, he will come, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> but he hears his voice, if you build it, he will come. And eventually he gets a vision, of a baseball diamond in the middle of his cornfield in rural Iowa. And this vision sticks with him so strongly that for the whole movie, he tries to make it happen. He builds this baseball diamond. He gets mocked by it by his family and friends. But he's so convinced that if you build it, he will come. And as he builds the field, an astonishing thing happens. Shoeless Joe Jackson, the ghost of Shoeless Joe Jackson, walks into the field. And the amazing thing is the better the field gets, the more and more ghosts from baseball past start showing up and they start playing 
ball and they start practicing with one another. And in the climax of this movie, spoiler alert, <laughs> eventually one more ghost of baseball pass shows up and it's his father. And they get to play ball, which is when all the men in the audience weep. <laughs> and then the movie ends with this wonderful shot. It's in the middle, it's nighttime, the lights are on the field, all these ghosts are playing baseball on the field, and the camera pans up, and you start seeing that there's a line in the dark of headlights just lining up as far as the eye can see in rural Iowa of people coming. People coming to watch baseball in the middle of nowhere. If you build it, they will come. So I, again, I think I've been in many churches, and I've grown up operating on the field of dreams theology. If you build it, they will come. If we build a great enough church, the crowds of people will come flocking through our doors. And so we devote so much time and energy to making sure that you know we're playing the right kind of music, making sure that the church budget goes to making the sanctuary state of the art. We cripple and fight over the color of the carpet and the comfort of the chairs because if we build it, they will come. We commission committees to design organs and buildings, or we install state-of-the-art sound systems that cost tens and thousands of dollars. We stress and worry about how to make preaching better, how to make the service better. We create programs designed to attract our key demographics into the building. We hire graphic designers, or as is more likely the case, we beg our graphic designer friends and family to do it pro bono for us, but to design our websites, to design our marketing, to, to figure out our social media strategy, to figure out our advertising, because if we build it, they will come. As long as we put out something that will attract people to us, the church is going to grow. As long as we put out the right product, the congregation will come. And I think what I've been convicted as we've gone through the series of what it means to be called by God and looking at these calling stories, I've come to realize that nowhere in these calling stories does God tell the people, build a field of dreams. Nowhere in these stories is the call to go build something that will draw people in. But the call is almost always, without exception, to get out from where we are now to get out from where we're comfortable, to let go of whatever hang-ups we have, to let go of whatever is keeping us back, and to just go where God tells us to. Now, if you're hoping that today's scripture might be a counterpoint to that argument, <laughs> I'm sorry to say that's not the case. For now, we meet Ezekiel at the moment of his call. As he receives a magnificent vision of God, and finds himself before his presence, and God calls him. And I think what I like about this call, of all the ones we've done so far, is that his seems to be the most bluntly realistic call yet. <laughs> God doesn't just give him a call, but he successfully demystifies the whole call to be a missionary process. He lays it out clearly, this is what it's going to look like. And there are three things that I noticed in this passage with regard to how God calls Ezekiel and by extension how God calls us. Now I'm pretty sure there are more than three points in this passage, but I've just grown up with three points in a sermon that I, I don't know, I just can't help doing that. <laughs> but here are the three things I found as I read this passage. The first one is that God does not seem to care about what our tangible results will be which flies in the face of a society that measures everything, measures success only by tangible results. He tells Ezekiel, I am giving you a message to the people of Israel, and I want you to go to the Israelites and tell them this message, and I want you to do it whether they will listen to you or not. I remember when I was growing up in a youth group in Malaysia, we were talking about starting some evangelism training in our youth group, because we were growing and we were starting to think, how can we expand beyond the church? And what we did was we found a bunch of evangelism tools. 
And basically what these tools were, were they were the gospel. They were the gospel, but narrowed down efficiently enough so that it could become a script that we could memorize and repeat verbatim when we met people. You know, there was one that was five verses in Romans that summarized the gospel. There was another one that was some sort of mnemonic device. I think the acronym was SAVE or something, and each letter meant something. My favorite was we came up with a general survey on religion that we could use. Um, at, you know, we use it as a way to get our foot in the door and open up a more pointed conversation about Christianity. We found so much materials of the techniques of evangelism, the way to effectively open up a conversation with non-Christians. And the reason we were excited the most was these people claimed, you do this, it will work. X amount of people have come to the Lord because they've used it, and X, it works a certain percentage of the time. And so we tried to adopt it in our evangelism ministries. We trained, we memorized the script, we practiced saying it to one another, you know, in these fake conversations that we have with one another. If it looked and sounded like training to be a telemarketer, it was because it was exactly <laughs> like training to be a telemarketer. <laughs> and no surprise, it failed horribly. I don't remember having one meaningful conversation with somebody trying to use any of those techniques. In fact, more often than not, people smelled a salesperson a mile away and tried to stay as far away from me as possible. The script didn't work because it wasn't genuine and it wasn't me. Now, don't get me wrong, I think our hearts were in the right place. What we wanted to see was people come to Jesus. We wanted to be as effective as possible in trying to help people come to Jesus. But I think we lost the plot because we became convinced that if we were going to do evangelism, we had to do it effectively. There had to be some tangible result that in order to know how good we're doing, we had to find ways to measure and quantify and analyze our effectiveness. And this passage reminds us, God's not interested in our tangible results. All he cares about is whether we are willing to go. Because as we read in Revelation 7, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne. It's not our job to save people. It's not our job to convince people of their sins. It's not our job to make them Christians. Because that's the work of the Holy Spirit, who works inwardly and in so many ways, works in ways we will never be able to see. It's not our job to do these things. But what God does require of us is to be a witness of the salvation we've received ourselves. To tell the world about the hope of the gospel, whether by the things we say, or sometimes just as importantly by the things we do. By loving our neighbor as God loves us, by being a help to the hurting as God has been our help. By pointing people through our words and actions to a God who loves this world more than anybody has the capacity to love anything. Who gave his only son that we might live, who comes to bring life and life abundantly. This is all we have to do. God's only job for us is to proclaim his salvation to the world. And as God tells Ezekiel, we don't need to worry if the world listens to us or not. It's not on us to create an appealing message. Our going into the world is not considered a success or failure if we reach a certain amount of people, if our church grows by a certain amount because of our results, if our budgets get balanced, whatever it is. Because if we do that, we're concerning ourselves with things we're not supposed to be concerned about. These things are for God and God alone to worry about. He calls us simply to go. Be his witness in the world, to proclaim the gospel shamelessly to the nations, and let him take care of the rest. So that's the first thing I noticed. And the second was that God calls Ezekiel and he calls us to go to really broken places. What I like about Ezekiel's call is that God is brutally realistic with him. He tells him first, I'm giving you a message to the people. Whether it looks like they will listen to it or not. And then he goes on to tell Ezekiel, and guess what? The people that I'm sending you to, 
I can almost guarantee that most of them aren't going to like you and you're not going to like what you have to say to them. Because the place Ezekiel is being sent to is described as a rebellious nation, an obstinate and stubborn people. He describes it as a place where briars and thorns surround me. Cool God, sign me up. <laughs> God tells Ezekiel not that he will live amongst lambs and puppies and all things safe and comforting, but that he's going to live amongst scorpions, you know? Things that will pinch and sting and will try to poison you if you try and get too close to them. At least God can't be accused of giving a false impression with the job description. <laughs> God is telling Ezekiel, go tell the people my message, and they're probably not going to listen. And if they listen, they're probably not going to like what they hear. And in fact, they might not like what they hear so much that they're going to shoot the messenger. Following God's call is not going to help you win friends and influence people. God was calling him not to preach to the choir, but rather God was sending him to the most broken of places. And since that got me thinking about our situation here in Seattle, because it's no secret out here, religion generally doesn't get a good name. And more specifically, the biggest beef people have with religion isn't directed at the other religions. It's directed at us, at Christians. And as an aside, sometimes your criticisms have been valid. <laughs> and while Seattle and the Pacific Northwest is open to spirituality, they're not open to Jesus. Pacific Westerners are independent, and stubborn and proudly so out here. We don't want to be preached at. I realize ironically as I am standing here preaching to you. <laughs> and so we as Christians in Seattle face the same dilemma as Ezekiel did, living amongst a people hostile to God's mission, a people who are probably not going to listen, a people who are probably not going to like what they hear, a people who might be hostile to any attempts to preach the gospel to them. And the temptation, as it almost always is, is to decide to close ranks amongst ourselves. It's to choose to be afraid of our surroundings and to choose to give up trying. The temptation is to look at our potential hostile audience out there and say, forget about it and focus on ourselves, our own problems, our own spirituality, our own personal need for healing and help, and our own personal salvation. The temptation is to hide our faith, or at least to become a covert Christian, so that we won't get outed as believers, unless we can guarantee for sure that's not going to come back and hurt us. But if we do that, we miss the whole purpose for why God called us to be His church. <coughs> Because God has not called us to be a church for ourselves. He has not called us here to gather once a week, to sing some songs, to hear some prayers, maybe get inspired by a sermon, and then go away and have our faith be hidden the rest of the week. But the reason we come here, the reason we sing, the reason we pray, the reason we bring our hurts, the reason we hear God's word, is so that we can be equipped to be sent out into the world. The only reason we gather here is to remind ourselves that God has created us, God has saved us, and God has empowered us to spread the gospel in the world. There's a reason why he calls us to the most broken of places. There's a reason why he tells Ezekiel to live amongst the briars, the thorns, and the scorpions. And it's because it's precisely in those areas that the gospel needs to be heard the most. It's precisely the people who are most resistant to the gospel who need to hear the message of God's reconciling love the most. Because here in Seattle, we have people who have tried cheap religion and had it fail them spectacularly. In fact, for a large amount of us, that's, that's happened to us. We've come here precisely because we have been tired of that same cheap religion. This city is filled with broken people each of them in their own desperate way, trying to put themselves together. Whether it's by getting fit or changing careers, whether it's by trying every religion under the sun or trying no religion at all. 
whether it's by getting into nature or trying to eat more holistically, almost everywhere you go at every street corner, you're going to find evidence of people desperately seeking an answer for the hole in their lives. And when I think about the city, I think about Matthew 9, when Jesus saw the crowds and he wept because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And I think just as he did in that day, he asked for more people to go out into the harvest field that's right at our doorsteps. And I think we've been uniquely gifted to do this at Harvard Church. Because as we've said so many times, we aren't a church of perfect people. We aren't a saint factory. We are people who have been deeply hurt in the past. We are people who, as best we can, try and be honest about our failures, our struggles, and our shortcomings. We understand, perhaps better than anyone, that accepting Jesus into our life is not the shortcut to an easy street. It's not going to keep us away from pain and suffering. But we stand here because we know that God accepts us as we are. He loves us in spite of our flaws. He finds more value in us than we could ever find in ourselves. He sees us not through the prism of our limitedness and shortcomings, but through his limitless grace. And this is precisely what the city needs to hear. Not that we have a panacea that will cure all that ails you. Not that Jesus makes all our problems go away, but that God loves us more than we could ever know. That his strength is made perfect in our weakness, that his grace and mercy covers our sins and our brokenness, and that in his hands, he makes all things beautiful and he makes all things new. But this city is not gonna hear that if we stay within these walls. Seattle will not hear us if we're just content to wait for people to show up at our doorsteps. As long as we keep waiting for people to come to us, rather than us going to where they are. As Jesus says, we're putting a bowl over our lamps and covering the light that God has for, to share, for us to share in the world. The only way the light gets shared is if we, like Ezekiel, are willing to go to those places where the briars and thorns are, the rocky paths, and the place where scorpions dwell. And the reason we can do this is because God also promises that if we step out there, he's going to meet us there. He promises to be our strength, our shield, our wisdom, and our hope. And he doesn't send us to the broken places alone. But today we celebrate Pentecost when we remember he has given us the Holy Spirit to be with us. So God doesn't care about our tangible results. And God calls us to go to the broken places. The third thing I think I got from this passage was, this call does not get accomplished by proxy. At the end of the passage, I read, God tells Ezekiel clearly, you must speak these words to them. You must stand up and open your mouth and eat what I give you. You must listen to what I say to you. This isn't a ta task that people can delegate. At the end of Jesus' time on earth, he reminds us not once, but twice of the same thing. In Matthew 28, he says to his disciples, Go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. And just in case they missed it the first time, he says it again in Acts 1, before ascending to heaven, when he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. As I said, today is Pentecost. Today is the day we remember when the Holy Spirit descended on that church in the upper room. Today is when we remember when Peter who was merely a bumbling fisherman, stood up in front of a crowd of people and empowered by the Spirit, preached and saw 3,000 people saved. Today is when we remember that the last plausible reason for us not to go was removed from us. We have received the Spirit. We have been empowered by Him. And it's clear that God's call for us is to go. 
But I think what has happened is that for some reason the church thinks that this is something we can do by proxy. As our churches got bigger, we found that instead of just being church together in mission in the world, we got big enough organizationally that we could arrange ourselves by departments. We could segment and specialize just as every growing business is wont to do. And so we created a children's department and we created a worship department. And before any of that, we established an accounts and administrative department. And we appointed people to wash the money and to create budgets. And as we kept getting bigger, we kept adding ministries and departments. And for a while it worked. We as a church in America kept getting bigger. It seemed that the field of dreams theology was true. We kept building it and building it and people kept coming. And then we got the brilliant idea of we can create a missions department and an outreach department. And so what happened then was that the call to go out into all the world could be fulfilled by that one department who inevitably would end up with the smallest budget anyway to do so. But all our efforts could be channeled through that department and more importantly, all the other departments in the church would be free from doing evangelism and outreach and mission and could instead focus on their own things. We could staff that department with the people who really cared about evangelism and outreach. Let's give it to them, to the gifted evangelists. And we could direct all everybody else elsewhere. And as a result, we as Christians could feel that even though we may not be actively trying to spread the gospel personally, at least we were supporting people who were. And that was good enough. And I put myself in that exact same camp. I mean, if you know anything about me, I'm an extremely introverted musician who after I'm done preaching this morning would like nothing better to do than to hold myself up in a room for, full of books and movies for about a week and not come out and talk to anybody. That, was, that sounds great. <laughs> I know I'm not a natural evangelist. And so I comforted myself by saying that I could just be someone who focused on the inner life of the church, you know? Let others worry about evangelism. I could just do my music. And slowly, more and more of us kept thinking that the job of evangelism and preaching the gospel and reaching out beyond our walls belongs to other more gifted people. We convinced ourselves that the gospel could be spread by proxy. And what I've had to be convicted of through this sermon series is that that is not in any way, shape, or form what God would have us do. And I think as we see the steady decline of the church in America, we can just see how flawed that thinking is. Because the gospel is not to be preached by proxy. He calls for all of us to be witnesses of the gospel. This isn't just something reserved for people who feel gifted to do it. He isn't just looking for competent communicators, for natural connectors, the people with the gift of the gab. He isn't just looking for the ones who have been trained to do evangelism or the ones who find themselves naturally successful at it. And he certainly isn't looking for those who are only passionate about spreading the gospel or helping those in the margins or have the time and space to do it. He calls all of us to do it. And as I mentioned earlier, it doesn't really matter how perceivably effective we are at it. God isn't concerned whether the people will listen or not. He just wants us to do it. And part of what God had to convict me this week was to realize, remember that evangelism program I mocked earlier in my youth group? And I just pointed out all the ridiculous flaws in it. What God had to convince me was that is infinitely better than not doing anything at all. He'd rather us stumble and bumble our way through loving others. He'd rather us make mistakes in preaching the gospel. He'd rather us step up ill-equipped and ill-prepared than wait around for the people who might actually be good at it. And the thing is, as I mentioned earlier, he does not send us out alone. He sends his Holy Spirit to equip and guide us to be our wisdom and strength. And I'm convinced that in each and every one of us, there is something that God has uniquely gifted to you that he can use and he will further to further spread the gospel in this land. And the more we are willing to step out, 
the more we are willing to make ourselves vulnerable. The more we find ourselves in the broken places, the more we have to let go of our comfort, of our security, and the more we have to rely solely on the Holy Spirit to be our guide and strength, the more that gift is going to come out and bless the people you minister to. But all this requires that you and I step out. We must not wait for others. We must not hope others will do it. Because this calls for all those who would claim Christ as Lord. He calls us to be his witnesses in all the world, whether they will listen or not. He calls us to make disciples in the most broken and hostile places of the world. And he calls us all to go, not to send some representative on our behalf, not to be supportive in some non-involved way, but to go in Crown Hill, in Seattle, in Edmonds, in Linwood, in Woodenville, in Everett, in Renton, in Tacoma, in Bellevue, to this state, to this country, to the ends of the earth. We are called to go and proclaim that Jesus Christ has come to seek and save the lost. We are, come, we are called to proclaim that God has come to bring life and life abundantly. We are called to shout back at the darkness that the light of the world has come into the world and the darkness will not overcome it. We are called to bring hope. We are called to show his love and to show his peace to a world desperately crying out for it. He has called us to proclaim that God so loves this world that he has given his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And he has not come into this world to condemn us, but to save the world through him. So the only question for us left this morning is, will we go? Will you pray with me? So Lord, maybe I speak for everyone, but I feel like we're challenged by this word. I am challenged by this word. And a lot of why I feel challenged is because I feel scared. I like knowing what to expect. I like being safe. But you call us to go. So teach us how to do that. And Lord, we cling to your promise that Wherever you send us to go, you will be there, and we ask that. We ask that your Holy Spirit, which you sent on Pentecost, will fill us and empower us and guide us and lead us. That you will show us um, what is that one thing that you have made us passionate about in your kingdom, and help us find the ways to pursue it. Lord, we pray and ask all this in your mighty name. Amen.